Hello, Politics Plus Media 101 listeners. If you're like us and you've been closely following the war in Ukraine, one name that you've been hearing quite a bit in the news is Yevgeny Prigozhin. And another name that you've been hearing quite often in the news is the organization that he runs, which is the Wagner Group, an infamous mercenary organization that has been committing acts of war not only in Ukraine, but across the world. This organization and this gentleman have been in the headlines quite a bit this week, and that's why we're sitting down with Katrina Doxy, who is an associate director and associate fellow for the Transnational Threats Project at the Center for Strategic International Studies, one of many experts that we brought here from CSIS. Katrina is an expert on all things Wagner, and she's going to walk us through the group and how they're impacting matters on the ground in Ukraine and elsewhere. So Katrina, I just want to first off, thank you very much for spending your evening with us. And before we get into the ins and outs of what the Wagner Group is doing, the geopolitics, the impact on the initial phase of the war in Ukraine, and then the escalation, I think it's important that we start with what are they? Uh, When we hear mercenaries in the Wagner Group, I immediately think to grade school when we were taught, or high school when we were taught about countries and leaders in the European Middle Ages, and then the German Hessians used during the Revolutionary War. And it invokes this imagery of hardened men who are battle thirsty, getting paid to go and basically commit atrocities that aren't under the banner of their flag, right? The nation that they're from, but rather it's totally a transactional approach. So Is this somewhat an accurate description of what the modern day Wagner Group soldier looks like? So it's funny you mentioned that because I think that's exactly the image that Wagner wants you to have when you hear that they're mercenaries or a private military company. They want to give off this sense of just being super experienced, just these super soldiers who can come in and get the job done. And In reality, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, as we'll discuss tonight. But I think I first want to start out just kind of unpacking some of that language we use to talk about them. So the the most common terminology that uh, has kind of come out for Wagner is to call them a private military company or a PMC. And that's just sort of the easiest shorthand we have for what they are. But Wagner really does operate very differently than other PMCs. So many countries around the world, including the United States, have used private military companies in the past. They're typically used in more of a standard contractor relationship as paid personnel who can carry out security and military tasks for the country who hires them for a price. What's happening, though, with Fogner and with a a handful of other smaller PMCs that are working with the Russian government, is that you have these organizations, and even organization is a hard word, right? Because we say private military company, Wagner Group, with group in the name, but it's really not one single entity. It's more of this loose network of different commercial entities and financial intermediary shell companies basically all a tangled web of finances and financial entities to make it as difficult as possible to track what they're doing and how the money flows. But these Russian PMCs, for lack of a better word for that nebulous network, are technically illegal in Russia, but permitted to operate through loopholes in Russian law because they are helping to further Russian geopolitical goals and economic goals, military goals. And so you see them really playing one of two roles. One is working directly alongside Russian forces, as we're seeing now in Ukraine, as we've previously seen in other theaters like in Syria, or even uh, when Wagner was first formed in Ukraine and after the 2014 invasion, uh, when we had these quote unquote little green men uh, running around in Ukraine, who are actually the the early form of Wagner and some other non-state actors aligned with the Russian government who are operating there to give Russia a sense of deniability. So that's one mode of PMC operations. The second resembles that traditional mercenary PMC role a little bit more, but 
with a conflict of interest. So this is what we're seeing more in sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, in some of these further afield locations, where Wagner comes to an agreement with a local government to deploy to help them with their security situation. Now, many times, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, we've seen these partner governments that they're working with be states that have weak governance, often that have had a recent transition of regime, uh, often through coups or other illegitimate means. And these states have both ongoing security challenges and rich natural resources. So in these cases, Wagner comes in and exchanges their security, intelligence, information operations for both a monthly salary from the local government, but also access to those natural resources, largely in the form of mining concessions, as well as the ability to further various Russian geopolitical goals while they're there. So on the one hand, they're being hired in, much as many states would hire a military contractor. But on the other hand, they have this competing goal where first and foremost, they're going to be carrying out Russia's interests as opposed to prioritizing the interests of the state that they are ostensibly serving. You were mentioning that in other countries, let's not look at Ukraine, let's take sub-Saharan Africa, for example, that the countries they're operating in pay the salaries. What would the salaries look like for the soldiers getting involved? I guess what is really interesting to me is, are these men that are, you know, like we're taught in school books that are just bloodthirsty and they see an opportunity to go scratch an itch and also further Russian interests overseas? Or is there some type of situation where it's very lucrative to go fight in Wagner Group and folks with military experience understand that maybe their prospects are a little bit bleaker back home and they're kind of almost forced into going to fight for Wagner if they want to increase their and their family's stanchion in life? How does that tension actually work out in reality? So... There are a couple of different questions within that when you're looking at the salary paid, because part of it is what's the salary being paid to the Wagner Group as an organization, and part of it is what is being paid to individual Wagner personnel. So as an organization, it's hard to know exactly how much they're receiving in a lot of these countries, um, in part because of how shadowy the financial aspect of the organization is. We've had some leaked reports from various countries throwing numbers out there. Um, but it's it's been fairly unclear what the baseline monetary aspect is. Um, and actually, in many cases, Wagner has been able to get contracts by underbidding other competing PMCs to say that they can do the job for less. But largely, they're able to do that because it's not just what's the upfront cost for services. They're also getting priority access to construction contracts uh, in the state. So, for example, in Madagascar, as part of their contract, they were able to um, try to negotiate for better rates um, and contracting jobs for port renovations that the country was planning for its largest port. In many of these countries, including the Central African Republic, Sudan, Madagascar, they've been able to pursue mining concessions, access to gold and gemstones, in some cases pursuing natural resources like liquid natural gas resources, energy resources. So all of that is able to supplement that on paper income that they have. So it's really hard to see what that total financial package is. And that leads into Wagner both being profitable for oligarchs like Prigozhin and other Russian leaders that it traces back to in Moscow as well as just self-sustaining and being able to support itself across all of these missions. And for, for the actual Wagner personnel, they typically have gotten higher salaries than individuals in the Russian military. And so this has perhaps changed somewhat in terms of recruiting patterns with what we see going on in Ukraine today, which we can get into later. But traditionally, Over the past nearly a decade or so that the Wagner Group has been operating, 
the typical profile for a recruit coming in to join Wagner is someone who is Russian. They previously served either in the Russian military or one of the intelligence services, and they've now left the service, but they're seeking a new career path after that that's going to pay better and give them opportunities to still build a career with their same skill set that they've built previously. And so we see that sort of this this setup benefits people on both sides, at least in that traditional um, model prior to some of the forced recruits and lesser experienced recruits we're seeing now, where you have people who are coming in and they get paid more to serve with Wagner, but Wagner is also able to secure a strong income to benefit both itself and the Russian state. Katrina, you mentioned that the prototypical Wagner recruit is a Russian. How close to universal is that? Are, are there many foreign fighters that are fighting as part of Wagner Group? Do they ever hire locals in the countries that they're operating in Africa? And are there any foreign fighters that are fighting on behalf of Wagner in Ukraine? There definitely are foreign fighters in their ranks, and I think they've become more common in the ranks, particularly over the past year since the invasion of Ukraine and with that added demand for fighters. So from from its early days, Wagner did largely recruit Russians. That said, they've also always had kind of a steady a steady stream of recruits coming in from these other locations where they're fighting and operating, especially in places where they're closely interfacing with local troops. So we've long had reports that there are some recruits coming from different African countries, from Syria and other places in the Middle East, um, from other countries in particularly Eastern Europe. But one thing that we've seen more so now, given uh, both the high demand for troops to fight in Ukraine and just the incredible losses that they're suffering in Ukraine that are necessitating more desperate measures to bring in more troops, um, we've, of course, had in the press widely reported that for a period of time, Wagner was recruiting heavily in Russian prisons. But we've also seen them recruiting in prisons in some of these other countries where they're present. So, for example, I think one of the most striking cases is the Central African Republic, where Wagner is helping the local forces to fight against rebel groups. But actually, over the past few months, we've had reports that they're bringing rebels out of prisons in CIR, so rebels that they put in those prisons, and shipping them off to Ukraine to fight on behalf of Wagner. So they're finding these different different pathways to conscript people in to fight for them. And in other cases, they're really preying on the hopes of people in some of these countries, offering them a good salary to join up with Wagner, a good opportunity for what's billed as a short-term contract. But then, you know, there's just a a really nasty death waiting for that person when they actually get to Ukraine and see these human wave tactics that are being used. Or that short-term contract is then extended over and over again or extended out indefinitely without really consulting with the person who holds that contract. And so we've seen a number of reports, even in countries in sub-Saharan Africa now, where families are learning about the death of their loved ones on the front lines in Ukraine and trying to trace back, wait, how did he actually get there? How did he get roped into this mess with Wagner? But the man you really need to know about is Yevgeny Prigozhin, a Russian oligarch. For years, he denied having any links to the Wagner group, but recently, that changed. In late 2022, he came out of the shadows. There are now several videos of Prigozhin at work with his forces on the ground and trying to sign up new recruits. Prigozhin also published this statement claiming that he founded the group back in 2014. Katrina, we're going to talk more about how Wagner are being used in Ukraine. But while we're talking about what Wagner is and why it exists, I wanted to get into who the gentleman is who founded Wagner and what sort of person he is and why he's been pursuing what he's been pursuing. And that's Mr. Uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. 
I, I was reading his biography before we set for this discussion, and I, I was pretty surprised about his background. It's not at all what I expected that it might be. I was expecting that he might have been a military veteran, but I found out that instead he is a former restaurant mogul, a chef who developed restaurants in Russia, made a lot of money, and somehow ended up down this path. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about this gentleman, who he is and how he got where he is. How did he go from being a restaurant founder to a mass murderer across the world? How did he pursue this without having a military background? And what really motivates him? Is it mostly financial or is he more interested in pursuing this goal of Russian power projection? Yeah. So as you mentioned, he much of his start came from these restaurants and catering businesses. And so people call him Putin's chef, you know, for, for all of these catering businesses that he ran. And you know, over time, as he built up those catering businesses, the, the food companies he would run, he eventually started to get contracts, uh, supplying food to the Russian military. Um, actually, some of those profits, um, it's been reported, went into him actually establishing the Internet Research Agency or the IRA, which is the organization that was involved in um, interfering with the U.S. elections uh, and which has also clearly lent a lot of its uh, tactics and strategies to Wagner as it pursues various disinformation and influence campaigns. Um, but o- over time, he kind of had his sphere of influence grow his relationship with Vladimir Putin grew. There's certainly, I think, a level of psychological analysis that could go into this that I'm not, I'm not the right person to get into. But I think that there was a certain lust for power that drove him as he continued to realize that he could put those profits toward more. And as he earned more and more money, even with some of those early businesses that he could live both a life of luxury and a life of increasing political power. And I think that that desire for power at all costs is really what we've seen motivating him and really strongly on display over the past year, as we've seen him push for Wagner to be closely involved in the operations in Ukraine. We have seen that he has gotten a lot closer to Vladimir Putin, often at the expense of some other Russian military leaders who received some of the blame for failures early on in the war. And now we see him more or less feuding with Gerasimov and various other Russian military leaders uh, in a way that seems like he's trying to just build an in for himself to insert himself into this higher level political position coming out of Ukraine and sort of building in a dependence on him as he continues to get closer to Putin himself. A piece that's really important to understand there about who he is as a person is that he is ruthless and violent and he's willing to do whatever it takes for his goals to succeed. So I think it's it's very easy for us in the West to think, oh, you know, a, a caterer, someone running restaurants and food service to think of all of the big restaurant figures we have in pop culture. But this is a man who delights in violence. This is a man who has adopted tactics of using sledgehammers against people to prove a point and to make those under him, whether they're other commanders or uh, infantry fighters, follow commands to not desert. He has used those same intimidation tactics against political opponents, both within Russia and outside of Russia in Ukraine and in the West. And you know, this is someone who has shifted his enterprises into the security realm, and he is perfectly uh, willing and able to use whatever whatever brutal means are necessary to achieve his tasks. Less Guy Fieri, more Pol Pot. Yes. Katrina, you mentioned that Prigozhin has gotten increasingly close to Putin over this long trajectory. I'd like to ask you to characterize that a little bit more. I've seen his relationship with Putin described in different ways, sometimes as a confidant, a real close advisor in the inner circle, and then other times as more like an acquaintance. 
So I've been trying to figure out exactly what the dynamic is between Prigozhin and Putin. How would you assess it? I think that it is really hard, you know, how to how to strike the balance between those two. I think that he has become more of a confidant as the war in Ukraine has gone on, particularly as Wagner has been able to come in and at least by appearances uh, be very helpful to the Russian forces, of course. Some of this you always have to take with a, a grain of salt, no pun intended. But of course, we had the, the video of Prigozhin allegedly in the salt mines um, at Bakhmut. And then that was proven to be actually far distant from the front lines. Again, even just over the past couple of days, he's released videos claiming to be at the front lines and actually filmed elsewhere. But, you know, I, I think that one of the clearest indications to me of his growing relationship with Putin is just the security that he has in his own political position and in his own safety. So I mentioned before that PMCs like Wagner are technically illegal under a Russian code. So they're only permitted to operate basically at the pleasure of the Kremlin. If they were to ever overstep and challenge official Russian forces too much, if they were to start pursuing activities that ran counter to Moscow's goals, Putin could essentially, with a snap of his fingers, make them disappear. They are illegal. They could be rounded up and arrested and all power wrenched away from them. And so that's always been what kept them in line with Moscow. And largely because of that, they have tried to operate in the shadows Prigozhin has long denied any kind of actual connection to Wagner, even going so far as to bring lawsuits against journalists or media outlets and researchers who allege that he does have this connection. All of that changed, though, last fall when Prigozhin suddenly came out and publicly recognized that he was involved with the founding of Wagner. He is currently their leader. It was shortly after that that he began to appear in these propaganda videos about the successes that Wagner was having on the front lines. And about a month after that, Wagner opened up its first official headquarters building. It's in St. Petersburg. It's on Russian soil. So all of this is happening in spite of the fact that it is still illegal under Russian law. And so for Prigozhin to be making such a show of this and to be really putting Wagner into the spotlight, I think indicates a level of security in his mind that he has reached a place of trust with Putin where Putin is not going to pull the rug out from under him. I think that sometimes, especially as he is increasingly antagonizing some of the other military leaders like Gerasimov, as we're seeing this feud start to play out publicly, Putin needs to sort of moderate uh, the tensions between them. He has to keep the balance. And certainly, uh, if some of the rumors are true, kind of have, have an escape valve for if anyone goes too far. And so I think that's part of why it's hard to get a real sense of what that relationship looks like, because Putin has to continue to balance, not play favorites too much, because he has to depend on all of these people. Uh, but I think that we certainly see that Prigozhin, at least, believes he is in a very comfortable position and is likely to continue to use the operations in Ukraine, as well as the benefits that Wagner provides elsewhere, to continue to grow his influence and increase his, his political prospects. The battle laying there, the stark divisions on the Russian side. With Wagner chief Evgeny Prigozhin openly blasting Russia's official military leadership, saying they manage soldiers from beauty salons and country clubs, arguing that if there were more of his private troops, they would be halfway across Ukraine by now. The toll has been so severe on the Russian side that according to Ukrainian officials, regular troops have been backfilling Wagner with mechanized infantry and tank units supported by artillery and aircraft. You've touched on a couple times now the public criticisms that Prigozhin has levied against Russian military leaders. 
and they appear to be somewhat legitimate, right? The troops are under-resourced, they don't have enough ammunition, body armor, etc. To the extent that we have any visibility into the relationships between Russian leaders and oligarchs, how do the military leaders view the Wagner group uh, more generally and specifically Prigozhin? Do we have any insight at all? Is he starting to grate on them and become annoying and really cause them problems? Or is this somebody that they can just kind of tune out? I think he's absolutely starting to grate on them. Just seeing some of the things he's saying, how frequently he's saying it, I can't imagine a world in which that isn't going to start to get to you when you're already suffering huge losses on the front lines in Ukraine in a war that was supposed to be over, what, a year ago. It was supposed to be a quick action to take this territory. And everyone is just trying to save face at this point. And I think that that's a big piece of it for Prigozhin as well. He, in his most recent comments, I think a through line was his insinuation that some of the refusal to give equipment and ammunition to Wagner was perhaps an attempt to be able to put blame on them for failures. And there may be some level of truth to that. I think that one of the big benefits to using Wagner for Russia is that it doesn't need to be held accountable in any sense for what Wagner does. You can't pin their atrocities and failures on Russia. Russia doesn't have to be held accountable to the families of Wagner personnel who are lost on the front lines. And if Wagner loses something, um, a key piece of territory, or suffers a lot of casualties, that doesn't have to come down as being on Russia. They can kind of deny it. And so, in a sense, he's right. But at the same time, Everyone is struggling to have ammunition and equipment and recruits just because the war effort is going badly. So in a way, Prigozhin is giving himself and the Wagner group an out in the same way that the Russian military can use Wagner as an out. So that if you keep blaming someone else, you give yourself a case for arguing that it wasn't your fault and you can continue to have a positive reputation after this. So we've kind of been demarcating the previous decade of Wagner Group and how they've operated with the last year or so in Ukraine from the media notoriety to maybe even the way they're getting their soldiers and their tactics and their actions. What does this mean in the actual battlefield on Ukraine? How are they being used over the last year in Ukraine? And more specifically, what does the command structure look like? Do, do we have any sense of whether or not when Wagner is engaged for a tactical goal that fits into the larger strategy of the Russian military a war of aggression against Ukraine, is the Wagner group and Prigozhin and everybody in their leadership kind of siloed off from the military? Or are they working hand in glove with the military? Are they coordinating support and, and other things of the like? What does this look like? So... To start out with what their role is in Ukraine, I think we've seen it really transform over the past year. So shortly after the invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, most of what we were hearing about Wagner was more of its traditional paramilitary operations. So small groups operating ahead of the front lines, carrying out some of those most dangerous missions because they're seen as more expendable. There were some reports, though, kind of the exact identity of people involved is a little murky, uh, but some reports that some of their missions included assassination attempts against Zelensky or other key Ukrainian figures. And so we had them continuing to operate in the shadows as part of the war effort. Over time, though, and as more Wagner personnel have deployed to Ukraine, as it became clear that this wasn't going to be a a quick get in, get it over with operation for Russia, we've seen Wagner more or less turn into an informal unit of the Russian military fighting along the front lines. So as we've mentioned, they are predominantly in and around Bakhmut. And they're there basically acting like a Russian unit, just leading the charge at the front lines. The tactics that we're seeing from them really are just these waves of infantry fighters coming forward, 
basically pushed into the meat grinder of war as cannon fodder. Um, there are really horrifying reports of the way that soldiers are brought into this. Basically, they watch people killed in front of them by their leaders and are told that's going to happen to you if you turn back or try to desert and then are just pushed forward in these waves of bodies. And as for how this is coordinated, it's it's difficult to tell. Um, so I can say this only with kind of a moderate level of certainty, but it appears that a lot of that coordination is happening really at the high up levels with Prigozhin, a few other people who are close to him or just under him. Otherwise, there really is that kind of stark difference on the front lines between Wagner and the official military, which feeds back into the general structure of Wagner as a non-Russian entity and a deniable entity to some extent, even though at this point it is very clear that they're operating on behalf of the Russian government. So Katrina, as Prigozhin has been criticizing the proper Russian military, he's been bragging about how important and effective Wagner have been in the war. And implicit in all of this is a kind of threat that he might stop participating. And I wonder if Wagner either collapsed or Prigozhin voluntarily disengaged his units, what impact would this have on the conflict? Could Russia continue its engagement without Wagner's support? Are they really that crucial to everything? I think that it's possible that they could continue. Um, Russia would certainly suffer setbacks along areas that Wagner has played the lead role, such as around Bakhmut. But I think that it would be a huge psychological blow more than anything else. At this point, even just in the in the debate around why Bakhmut is such a focus, it really has become a symbolic target for Russia. And it's really been cast as this symbol of, you know, potentially Russian success, something that they can point to. And I think if Wagner were to leave and if they were to have that symbolic loss all tied up into one, that would be a pretty big psychological blow to Russia, while at the same time being something that can boost the morale of the Ukrainian side, particularly as the Ukrainians are really digging into a war of innovation, a war that depends on their determination to stick this out and to be emboldened by their unexpected victories over the past year. Um, I I think it would just really psychologically weaken the Russian position. That said, I think that it would be a very extreme move on Prigozhin's part to completely pull out of Ukraine. I think that the only way he does that is if he is forced to by the Russian military establishment and told by Putin to remove his troops. Otherwise, I think he's signing a death warrant for the Wagner group. He's potentially getting himself into very big trouble with Putin. I don't see that he rehabilitates his relationship with Putin after that if he does just fully pull out. I think that he might threaten it. He's going to talk about the risks of it. He was just saying today that there's you know, the chance that that part of the line will completely collapse without additional supplies sent to them. He's putting forward a bluff to get what he wants. I don't see that it's in his best interest to actually abandon the war effort entirely. He sounds very Machiavellian. You mentioned, though, that they're being used as cannon fodder. And that made me think, where the heck is he continuing to get conscripts? I think it's now infamous that they pulled murderers and rapists out of prisons across Russia, which we briefly touched on to fill up their ranks. So we'd have to assume that uh, they're maybe not as well-trained as they have been in the past or the public posturing that they're using. But there's only so many of these you know, malcontents back home that you can fill your ranks with. So are they still conscripting people from prison or is there a different approach? And, and how are they um, you know, resupplying their cannon fodder? So it does look at this point like they've stopped recruiting from prisons. A couple of weeks ago, Prigozhin announced it as a policy change. But just after he announced that, we began to see the Russian military recruiting in those same prisons. So it looks like that was another switch where 
the Russian military needed more recruits. So they stepped in to take those recruits rather than Wagner, which frankly could also be contributing to the additional vitriol and his back and forth with the military leaders at this point. We have seen that Wagner has continued to recruit uh, out of area as well. So in some of these other countries where they're present, including both in prisons in some of those countries, like in the CAR, as well as just among the population with people who are desperate to be able to earn money to support their families. So we have seen them continue to pull from sources like that. But I think that like the regular Russian military, they're certainly at a point where, especially as the the rumors and the accurate reporting spreads about what happens when you sign up with Wagner, when you go off to Ukraine and you're part of these human wave attacks, it's harder to get people to voluntarily sign up. You have to force them into it. And over time, they're going to have to start, you know, manipulating and conscripting populations that become less and less politically popular to pull from if they're pulling in Russia. So they're going to increasingly rely on people out of area, which comes with its own political costs, including if it's in countries where Wagner is operating, but might not have fully integrated itself to the point where the local government couldn't push back against them. And I think that's a challenge that they're definitely going to have to face. And certainly, as they continue to use some of these newer recruits in their out-of-area operations in places like Africa, I think we're going to really see the impact of the change in quality. So you've gone from having people who have experience in the military or in the intelligence services, and the majority have gone through training with Wagner before actually being deployed into the field. Going from that to now individuals who have little to no prior experience doing military operations, you have huge just schisms in the ranks, uh, especially with some of the social stigma that comes along with the prisoners, not only prisoners versus non-prisoner recruits, but even within the prisoner population, there is such a strong social hierarchy within Russian prisons that reports have said that even when they have units full of prisoners, they have to divide out different types of prisoners, different status prisoners, because otherwise they refuse to interact together or they'll end up fighting each other. You're going to just have a lot of problems with lack of skills in the field, lack of the ability to work together cohesively, and just a lack of training and discipline. And when you combine that with the fact that in its various deployments, Wagner is already committing a wide variety of human rights abuses and war crimes. They've had a variety of operational failures due to poor planning or the inability to work in a local environment. I think we're going to just see more and more cases where they're unable to fulfill the tasks that they were hired to do by the host government. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see more and more of these massive human rights abuses, indiscriminate killings of civilians, and other war crimes. Katrina, you talk about the war crimes and atrocities that have been committed and will be committed by Wagner personnel. And it makes sense as you describe how recruits who are not properly trained won't be disciplined and might not understand the proper conduct of war. We've also been talking throughout this conversation about the brutality of Prigozhin and many of the people that he operates with. So it's understandable to me that perhaps Wagner would be especially cruel and brutal in the way that it conducts war. But then at the same time, I look at the activities of the proper Russian military. I look at the atrocities committed in Bukha. I look at Mariupol, which was destroyed and is uh, unrecognizable to its its former form. We hear about civilian targeting all over Ukraine. And it makes me wonder, even if we can recognize how brutal Wagner has been and continues to be. How much of a qualitative difference is there between them and the actual Russian military in regard to these atrocities? Yeah, I I think that one of the issues that comes along with all of this is that with a state like Russia behind you, there's there's no real pressure to not commit atrocities. There's no expectation that human rights, human life is a value that you should pursue in the course of your operations. And frankly, with some of the more autocratic governments that Wagner is working with, 
the local government doesn't care either. In some cases, the ability to work with a partner like Russia and the Wagner Group that also disregards um, civilians' lives or rights, that's appealing when you have a military junta in power with local soldiers who also have a long history of human rights abuses. This is certainly the case in a place like Mali, where you see Wagner integrating in with the local armed forces and together carrying out widespread human rights abuses, including um, most infamously the massacre at Mora that happened last spring. So number one, yes, I think that definitely this uh, just rampant uh, frequency of human rights abuses by all of the Russian military and all forces on behalf of Russia certainly colors what we can expect from Wagner. But there's also a level with Wagner where they know that there are very few channels where they can be held accountable. Some of that is because of the very murky connection back to Russia. Some of it is simply because of how just complicated and unclear the relationships between the different entities within the Wagner group are. And some of it is that the local regimes they're working with are not interested in pursuing justice for the things that they've done. They're able to just more or less do as they please throughout these operations without having much concern for how that would impact the longevity of their contract, without concern that someone's going to have oversight over them. We've certainly seen widespread human rights abuses in Ukraine and elsewhere by the Russian military. But I think there's just an added nonchalance toward it by Wagner because they know that there is a minuscule chance that they'll actually be uh, held to account because of it. Throughout this discussion, we've been talking about how Russia enjoy a kind of hazy connection to Wagner and maybe even in some contexts, a plausible deniability that they've directed Wagner's actions. But in the incredibly hypothetical and probably unlikely scenario that Russia actually were before an international criminal tribunal, would it not be rather simple and and quite relevant to connect Russia and the Russian state to the activities of Wagner, Uh, especially in the last year, as we've seen that the connection has become so much more explicit? Wouldn't it indeed be very possible at this point to demonstrate how the actions of Wagner do indeed reflect on the direction of the Russian state? So I won't get too deep into the legal side of things, not being a lawyer uh, myself, but I do think that this is one of the really big impacts and potentially a a place of opportunity for the U.S. and our allies and partners um, in terms of Wagner's recent activities. We have long recommended that Seeking out ways to hold them accountable is one of the one of the best ways to counter Wagner's activities, um, as well as just bringing transparency to really the true cost of partnering with them. But now, since last fall, when Prigozhin came out so publicly asserting his connection to Wagner with the establishment of their headquarters in St. Petersburg and the growing evidence we have of them coordinating with the Russian state, including on their operations in Ukraine, I think that we really are getting much more evidence out into daylight that they are connected, as we've always known, but haven't had as much on paper to point to. And I think that just points to an ongoing question that I think we're going to see Wagner trying to answer over the next year, which is, what is the future of the Wagner Group? In some ways, it seems that in the European theater, with a focus on Ukraine, Wagner is evolving into just a new stage in its life cycle where they are more overt in their operations. They're more forthcoming about who they are, about their connection to the Russian government. They've created this headquarters, which uh, notably soon after it was created, put out a notice for a hackathon. Uh, on various online channels. Of course, once that was noticed by anyone in the West, they took down the the posts advertising it. They're trying to change and advance the way they operate in Europe, while at the same time maintaining the same operations that they have in Africa and other locations further abroad, where really their operations hinge on having this level of deniability, this level of avoiding 
accountability or anything that would blow back on Russia. And at the end of the day, they can't have it both ways. And I think that that discrepancy in how they want to exist and be perceived in each of those theaters is going to come back to bite them. And I think it affords the US and our allies a lot of opportunities to start to pry into those weaknesses while, you know, Wagner has not figured out how to actually square the circle with that difference. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby said Friday that Wagner, which has claimed credit for Russia's battlefield advances in Ukraine, would be designated a significant transnational criminal organization, a move that would freeze any U.S. assets and prohibit Americans from providing funds, goods or services to the group. With these actions, and there'll be more to come, our message to any company that is considering providing support to Wagner is simply this. Wagner is a criminal organization that is continuing wide, I'm sorry, committing widespread atrocities and human rights abuses. And we will work relentlessly to identify, disrupt, expose, and target those who are assisting Wagner. You touched on the funding mechanisms, how it's been very opaque and difficult to draw these connections due to shell companies and the accounting and the different mechanisms they're using to evade that type of detection. So I was wondering, are U.S. sanctions and Western sanctions having any impact on either their funding or their ability to up-level their operations to a more 21st century type of military campaign? The U.S. and various European and other partner countries have brought a number of sanctions against Prigozhin and various of his allies and supporters in different parts of the Wagner group. I think there's been some mixed success there by the nature of the group. It can evolve so quickly and use all of these different artificial financial structures that they're able to evade some of the sanctions. And actually, one of the One of the biggest ways that they've been able to avoid some of those sanctions and actually have helped the Russian government to soften the blow of the sanctions that have been levied against it in the wake of last year's invasion of Ukraine has been through the smuggling and exploitation of natural resources in the countries where Wagner's operating. So, for example, in countries like Sudan and the Central African Republic, as part of the deal to have Wagner operate in country, They've been able to secure mining concessions to access uh, gold mining, diamonds and gemstones. And we see them then smuggling uh, these raw materials out of the country and into other markets like in the UAE, where they can easily liquidate those resources without any kind of real checks or accountability and then profit from that cash. or Uh, In some cases, reports that they're able to bring gold out of a place like Sudan and use it to directly bolster Moscow's gold supplies um, in order to blunt some of the sanctions against Russia. So there are certainly a lot of loopholes that they're able to exploit. Sanctions as a whole are certainly one helpful tool for fighting back against them, especially if we can get down to the level of targeting the mining companies that are exploiting those resources targeting the companies that are specifically in that chain of exploitation, helping to ship materials to try to tighten up different restrictions uh, in some of these nations where they're able to take advantage of just sort of no questions asked marketplaces. Because at the end of the day, Wagner is a business. The best way and maybe the most realistic way to envision actually hurting their operations, stopping them from continuing to spread is to undermine the business case. So that's cutting out profits, showing potential partner governments the true costs of doing business with them, that it's not a good deal. Even if they offer you a lower price, here are all of the other harmful things that come along with partnering with Wagner. And I I think that the more the US and other Western allies can undermine the business case and what makes Wagner profitable, the less 
Wagner is going to be able to continue to secure contracts, the less that this model is going to be beneficial to Prigozhin or others in Moscow. We've been talking about the differences between Wagner and the Russian state, or the lack thereof, and why that's relevant. One thing of note is that the United States have been very careful with red lines on engaging in direct combat with Russia and the Russian state itself. In Ukraine, we've done so much to support the Ukrainian effort with funding and equipment and training, but we have made sure that we haven't crossed that line and engaged directly with any Russian soldiers. That's not actually true of Wagner. I think it was in 2018, the US military killed Wagner fighters in Syria. So it's interesting to make that distinction between Wagner and the Russian state with this in mind. Do you think that we could say that the United States, even if we're not at war with Russia, actually are at war with Wagner? I wouldn't go so far as to say at war with Wagner. Of course, there was the recent designation of Wagner as a transnational criminal entity, uh, which I think was certainly well earned um, by them. Aside from that interaction in Syria, we haven't had as much in terms of actual firefight between the two sides. Frankly, that's an area where the U.S. needs to establish a clearer and more coordinated policy. Up until more attention has come on to Wagner uh, in the context of Ukraine, there really hadn't been sufficient conversation, in my opinion, about Wagner within the U.S. government. Even now, efforts are fairly fragmented with Congress trying to get up to speed with what Wagner is and trying to come up with solutions, with DOD doing the same, state and USAID doing the same, the intelligence community continuing to track their activities. We haven't really had a centralized interagency mechanism for tracking, collecting information on Wagner and coming out with a very clear strategy. And actually, one of the biggest concerns that I've been hearing over the past several years as I've been tracking their activities is coming from uh, individuals in the U.S. military and intelligence communities who are regularly deploying to areas where you know Wagner is active either in the country they're in or in neighboring countries throughout the region. And they report that they're regularly seeing, if not Wagner personnel themselves, the effects of their activities, whether that's disinformation, the deteriorating security situation. And they don't have clear guidance on what to do if they are confronted directly with Wagner. I think there's a lot of confusion within uh, even you know military operations that are happening co-located with Wagner deployments over, is Wagner Russia? If we get into a firefight with these guys, is that causing an international incident? Is that causing potential war with Russia? Or is Russia going to default back to, oh, they're not officially Russian, so we don't need to get dragged into this? And then, uh, we, you know, we spoke about the changing nature of Wagner in terms of being more transparent with its connection to Russia, how that could be used to hold them accountable. If we start trying to hold them accountable because of their connections to Russia, does that then change the policy for how we interact with them in the field if our military or intelligence personnel come into contact with them? Can we say, in one context, we are connecting you to Russia, and then in another, that we're not attacking Russian troops? And I don't personally have answers to those questions. And my worry is that the US government as a cohesive whole, also does not have answers to those questions. I think that the conversation about Wagner needs to go a lot farther than just what we're seeing in Ukraine, what we've seen in individual deployments in sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America or these other regions where they're active. And it needs to be a conversation that brings in all of these pieces together and recognizes that, number one, Wagner is going to continue to operate for its own profit and both the profit and political positioning of Prigozhin. And it's also going to continue to operate in a coordinated way to pursue Russian geopolitical, military and economic goals. And in light of that, we also need to have a coordinated way to understand what they're doing, 
and to respond to it. And I worry that we're just not quite there yet.